Hi all, and welcome. We are pleasantly surprised as we gather here in the Priest's Sacristy of St. Mary Church for the second of three church tour videos full of grace. Uh, the last one I did was about the church structure that you see, that assembly sees, that the people all gather in which. This is the behind the scenes. So my second of the series is all about what goes on behind the vessels, the vestments, the liturgical books. So welcome, sit back, and I hope you enjoy your time with us. I begin with, as I do most things, with the documents, the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy. It is the Magna Carta of all documents that was issued and published, promulgated in 1963 as a result of the Vatican Council documents. It was the first, the Constitution and the Sacred Liturgy. You know, Pope St. John XXIII called the Vatican Council together, died, and then Pope Paul VI completed the Second Vatican Council. And out of a number of liturgical documents and bishops' decrees were given. The Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy is the first and the foremost. Allow me to read. It was promulgated by Pope Paul VI and the Fathers of the Second Vatican Council on December 4th, 1963. And it is the Magna Carta for all the liturgical reforms instituted by the Council that was held between 1962 and 65. Yes, I was a mere child at that time, but my job, role, responsibility as pastor, as priest, is to make sure that the liturgical documents are well versed by me as well as in place for all of us. This second series is about the stuff that goes on behind the scenes, the liturgical stuff that happens behind. And you can see behind me, hanging on the closets here in the priest sacristy, are various colored vestments. We've known them as chasubles, vestments, long robes, that color thing that Father wears that we put on top of the first garment that we wear. It's called the alb. At baptism, when we had our first sacrament of initiation, we were clothed in white, a family baptismal garment, perhaps that was handed on from years to year. That is our liturgical garment, the garment that all will wear, the 144,000 in Revelation, dressed in white to meet the heavenly thrones. And on that throne is the King, the Savior. White alb, we put our white albs on, as our first garment when we get ready for Mass. And then we clothe ourselves in the colors of the liturgical year. You may know by now, perhaps maybe you're going to be better versed in this, we have liturgical seasons of green in ordinary time. We have the liturgical seasons of purple, a kind of a blue-violet purple in the season of Advent in preparation for Christmas. We have the royal purple, I like to call it the red purple, the brighter colors that has some blood-colored stains in it, of Lent. We have the seasons of white, the Christmas season, the Easter season. And throughout the years, we celebrate feasts of martyrs and our Lord's death on Good Friday and Palm Sunday when we will wear red. You'll see that I'm blessed with having a number of vestments, either purchased by myself, given to me as gifts, that celebrate the ordinary times of the year. Right here now is the green. I call this the greens of fall, kind of an olive green, with the colors of the fall season, the leaves, rust colors. We also have a green that also celebrates more of a winter color green from the Christmas season before we move into uh, Lent, a kind of a brighter colored, it almost looks like a stained glass colored green. In the closet behind me, I'm going to open up that closet. A number of other colored greens as well. Again, this is Father's personal choice, his liturgical style, and each of us, both Father Cole, Father Stock, and myself, as well as the, the priests that have gone before us, we have many of our own, our own vestments that we choose to wear. Different colors at different times. Another shade of green, 
uh, obviously it's a lighter shade of green, multiple colors like Joseph and the Technicolor Dream Coat, multiple shades of green that I would choose to wear like in early spring, as well as other colors of green throughout, many of which we have matching dalmatics for the deacon, so that the deacon and the presiding priest will wear a similar color or the same style of vestment to give a sense of the seasons as we move through the seasons. Because ordinary time is the longest season, 33, 34 weeks, we, I've chosen to have different colors of green just to help break up that season, to help us through the year as well as we go. Whites, wonderful whites of the season, Christmas whites, Easter whites, celebratory whites that we use throughout the year. Behind me I have is one of the Christmas whites that we have um, with the matching deacon stole. We have a Marian white that we wear on our Marian feasts of the Assumption or Immaculate Conception, those kinds of colors as well. And then when we open up the closet, there's also other shades of, of white, off-white, even gold. Gold is an appropriate color that we could use throughout the year for Christmas and Easter. And a number of years ago, six years ago, uh, the family, the uh, Kazgan family, made a generous donation for us to invest in a funeral set of vestments with the, with the priest's chasuble, with the dalmatic, and the funeral pall, all purchased in memory of Mr. Kazgan, who died six years ago. So again, the colors of St. Mary, the blue, the gold, and the white. So every time we celebrate a funeral, we wear these vestments. Green and white are the most popular. We have purples. We have purples, and I usually use the phrase two different colors of purple. We have what I call the royal purple. As you can see, if you can tell, it's got a lot of red through it, some red strains through it, so it looks very, uh, we call, that's why we call it royal purple. I have a Roman purple that has got a completely different look to it, as you can tell the difference. It is a purple that celebrates the darkening winter skies of December in preparation for the birth of the Nativity. Uh, the liturgical documents, Art and Environment, suggest that the purple of Advent should be like the midnight sky. Not blue, but that purple with a lot of blue in it, as well as, in contrast, the red purple that we would use in the season of Lent. This year, you're happy to see that we have a different new color vestment for Advent this year that was given to us as a, as, a, as a gesture. So it's got the purples of the season as well as some of the highlights of blue this year. So we're using this color throughout the season of Advent to get the us, the family of faith, to know that this is a special season, a different season. Purple, the Advent purples. And then there are the reds. Red is red is red is red. We've got the bright reds of the season. Most of the times we use them for um, uh, the martyrs' feasts, the death of our Lord, Palm Sunday, special feasts of Simon and Jude, Peter, um, the, who are martyrs of the faith. So we would use the reds. Um, so we have multiple styles and colors. So those are the vestment colors of choice that we have another red, um, also that has some accents to it to help us celebrate the season as best as we can. Those are the vestments, the vestments of the season. Again, Father Stock has some of his own personal vestments. Father Cole uses some of the parish vestments, so we try to uh, blend well and celebrate well. Those are the vestments. So the question has come to us, as always, why vestments at all? We certainly, as a priest, as a pastor, we offer the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And as such, we clothe ourselves in the garment of sacrifice. We put on our albs to uh, cover up any earthly clothing, knowing that we're walking into the heavenly realm. And we put on the color of the season to remind everyone that 
something very particular and very unique and very special is happening. Father is just not representing, but Father is offering the holy sacrifice of the Mass, and as such, we wear a garment that gives that indication to the assembly. So we wear the colors of the season as we celebrate the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Hope that answers your question. So we've moved to the other side of the priest sacristy, to the cabinets on the other end. And behind me is one of Father Stock's vestments, his olive green vestments with the beautiful brocade yoke around it. But I'm standing in front of what we call the uh, vessels cabinet. And in the vessels cabinet, we keep the vessels that we use for communion, communion distribution, both from the body and blood of Christ, the bread and the wine. We have a couple of different uh, sets, uh, a pewter set, as well as a brass gold set. The, the pewter set, of course, you've seen these cups. Uh, we're not using them at present during the pandemic, but this would be the um, assembly's common communion cup from which they would receive the blood of Christ. I have a set of silver uh, pewter uh, that are polished and shine that we use during seasons of Advent and during Lent to remind us that we're still in a season of preparation, a season of waiting, a season of reconciliation. Uh, one of the bowls that goes with that silver set, for lack of anything else, um, a larger bowl as well that goes with, um, for the communion, the larger hosts that we use. There's the assembly's host and then there's the priest hosts that are rather large. Um, pitchers, of course, the silver pitchers that go along with that set that uh, we use for um, preparation of the gifts, which we prepare the chalice with. These are the silver sets, and above them on the shelves are the gold cups. These uh, uh, we use at the celebration seasons. We do use them at Christmas time and at Easter time, the season uh, during the summer as well, um, back and forth, just uh, to know that we have them. We give them kind of a break, um, you know, with being gold plated on the inside, sometimes washing too much, too often, too harshly takes the uh, finish away, which we have to have, and we just had these redone uh, maybe about three years ago, thanks to all the generous donors. Again, a set that is for us with matching pitchers, larger pitchers for the wine. Um, note for both the gold set as well as the silver set, we have the hand washing bowls and small pitchers for uh, Father to fill the chalice or to wash his hands, small silver and gold uh, hand washing bowls. On this side of the vessel's cabinet, of course, is the safe, the safe in which we hold the more precious or most precious chalices uh, and other items as well. The safe opens and I'm gonna move myself to the other side of the safe and you'll follow me. And inside the safe is the gold uh, communion bowls. Again, these are a little more precious than the silver set. So we keep these stored in the safe along with the larger bowls that we have. Again, a set that goes with that. And then on the second shelf are the gold chalices or the chalices of each of the priests, Father Stock, myself, and Father Cole, as well as some of the house chalices, I, I, I like to call them. Uh, this is a house chalice. Uh, it was a ciborium. It had a different type of uh, bowl or cup on it many, many years ago. And I had the cup changed to fit so we could use it as a chalice. And we have these for matching the gold set that we use throughout the season. We have um, uh, another house chalice, that's a house chalice. Another house chalice that is both silver and gold, uh, a gold filigree and a silver cup, if you can tell the difference to it, a celebration. Again, these have been um, given to us 
donated to fathers, fathers, fathers over the year. Family members have given them in honor of deceased loved ones. Many times they are engraved on the bottom. Not all of them are, but engraved in memory of. Um, some of you may remember Tony Steele. This one was in memory of Tony Steele by the family uh, given to us a number of years ago. One of the um, significant house chalices is this rather tall, rather somewhat ornate with amethyst and diamond chips around the node here, as well as the cross in amethyst, as well as some beautiful iconic iconography uh, on, the, on each of the sides, the Lamb of God and uh, fishers of men, the, the wheat and the uh, grapes. Um, again, given to us in memory of uh, family members that we use at different times and different seasons of the years, um, many of which are gold-plated. These are not necessarily solid gold, but they are gold-plated and precious to, to, to us all. Father Stock, uh, who's come to us, has a couple of different styles of chalices as well, given to him by his family and his uh, extended family um, at time of ordination or whatever. So again, personal choices for us to use these. We do like to use the seasonal uh, vessels of the bowls at the seasons, but Father gets to choose um, the chalice, whatever. This would be Father Stock's chalice. The, or this is Father Cole's chalice. I'm sorry, those were Father Stock's. Father Cole's chalice when he was ordained in 1972. Um, and it's engraved on the bottom, but it's really very, very faint. Um, but it was given to him at Christmas of 1975 in, mem in memory of some family members. Beautifully, beautifully uh, for him. And then my chalice is back here as well. My chalice actually is an art piece, was um, commissioned by me, by a, a silversmith in Cleveland when I was ordained. And it was part of the um, Cleveland Museum of Arts May Show um, a number of years ago, uh, a sign signature piece for a singler. How do you get that? Um, in pure silver as well as some modified other uh, mediums of copper and bronze and sterling. Um, it's got a great story to it, so maybe it's too long of a story to share with you today, but you can always stop and ask me about this on display at the Cleveland Museum of Art before I was ordained. It did not win a prize by the artist, and be grateful for that because had it won a prize, it would have had to remain at the Cleveland Museum of Art. So it was kind of a touch and go kind of season that year. Other vessels are in here. The monstrance, you know, we use for Eucharistic adoration. The monstrance is kept in here and other items as well, various other uh, items. Vessels. The vessels of the holy sacrifice of the Mass are kept here. There's other little things that we use. Small bowls for like a ring dish at wedding. The hand washing bowls and cruets. We have glass sets, silver set as I've already mentioned, and a gold set. Um, so we try to share the uh, joy of mixing it up and letting us know which season we're in when we see the vessels and the vestments. Thank you. So, with the documents of the Vatican Council, Sancro Sanctum Concilium, the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, and there's various different other documents that go along with the liturgy of the Mass, lectionary, music, Roman Missal. So a few number of years ago, the Roman Missal, that is the priest's prayer book. That's the book that has all the prayers that Father proclaims and prays with you and for you, Sunday, weekdays, and every other celebration, the Roman Missal. It used to be called the Sacramentary, but now it's called the Roman Missal. It is one of the significant books of the church. Every pastor, every priest, every deacon who celebrates any kind of service, celebration, prayer, and or mass uses the Roman Missal. The Roman Missal here in the sacristy are kept underneath ritual books. We have 
a different variety of them, a different uh, ornamentation, illumination, celebration of the Roman Missal. But every Roman Missal, when it is opened, will have all the prayers of the church. The collect, you remember if you've heard that word, where we, the opening prayer at Mass, the prayer over the offerings, the preface that we sing or recite now before we sing the Holy, 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 now we recite it, as well as um, the concluding the prayer after communion. The, the lectionary um, is the second book, but the Roman Missal is Father's Prayer Book. So this is the one that we're using currently. It is on the altar. We open it at the altar now with the, uh, the COVID uh, regulations. It's open at the altar at all times, and Father's really the only one that prays it. A server would hold it for us at different times. I have this beautiful illuminated um, Roman Missal that has got some magnificent pictures and artwork in it that I use for the different seasons of the year, um, particularly for Christmas and Easter, some gorgeous artwork in it that um, the co liturgical company has created and put in place for us. Nobody gets to see it except me, but I'm lucky. And so now I get the chance to show it to you. But again, again, it will have all of the prayers, the opening prayer, the prayer over the gifts, and the concluding prayer after communion in this, as well as our Eucharistic prayers, the variety of Eucharistic prayers that we offer and pray at Mass. Eucharistic prayers 1, 2, 3, and 4, Euchar reconciliation, uh, Eucharistic prayers, as well as prayers of various needs and occasions. All of these in our Roman Missals that we have. We have a multiple variety of them. The second most important book is the lectionary. That is the book of the, the Bible, the readings. The New American Bible translation is put into a volume for weekdays as well as a volume for weekends, and it would have the cycles. If you remember, we have three cycles during the Sunday cycles. We have cycle A, cycle B, and cycle C, and the lectionary will identify in the corner of which cycle we're reading, A, B, or C. And of course, the lector, the priest, the deacon will have to set the books up properly so that we can read the correct readings for that Sunday. This coming Sunday, we will celebrate and that reading is opened and ready for them. Along with the lectionary, there is the option to have what we call the Book of the Gospels. Again, an illuminated book that is just the Gospels. This would be the deacon's book. This was a gift given to him at the time of Deacon Tom's ordination. So we use it uh, when he's celebrating. And it would have the Gospels for that Sunday uh, in it, or the feast day, or the solemnity, or a holy day would have it in here. And again, the lectionary the Book of Gospels. These are the two main books that we would use throughout the year, weekdays, weekends, and for all celebrations that are very important. The Roman Missal, as well as the lectionary. What guides us is a small little text, a book called the Ordo. And the order, Ordo is the order of prayer in the liturgy of the hours and the celebration of the Eucharist. It is a small book for the state of Ohio from the Archdiocese of Cincinnati that governs us and all the, uh, the dioceses in uh, Ohio. And this book will, uh, when you open it up, it will have the day and the type of day it is, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Is it a holy day? Is it a holiday? Is it a memorial? Is it a feast? Is it a solemnity? Is it an optional memorial? This book guides us as to the prayers of the church. Very important. What I also like about the Ordo is on the left side of it, it has the necrology. It has the deaths and the death dates of all the priests here in the Diocese of Cleveland, as well as in the diocese throughout the state of Ohio. So I can open up the day for the day we're at and look at it and find out that Father so-and-so died, and I can remember and I offer him my prayer or them my prayer when I celebrate the Liturgy of the Hours, which is the priest's 
prayer of the church. So we're bound by uh, our ordination to pray for the church, the universal church, and with the church in what's called the Liturgy of the Hours. That's another book. Well, it's several books, actually. And it is guides us in our daily prayer and our daily holy hour. Liturgy of the Hours and the Liturgy of the Eucharist is the Roman Missal and the Lectionary. So that probably pretty much concludes our church tour number two of what goes on behind the scenes, the vessels, the vestments, and liturgical books. Thanks for sticking with me. I hope it's been informative, inspiring, and again, get to us, any one of us, if you have any questions. Peace out.